Okay, we continue with the hardware, hardware portion of the course. This is lecture number 10. We're talking now about the clock generator. There is a chip used with the 8086, 8088 processors which generates the clock for the processor. It is 8284A. And as a matter of fact, it provides three main signals to the microprocessors. The clock signal used to regulate events taking place inside the microprocessor. The reset signal, a signal requires to reset the microprocessor whenever it starts up, it boots the system. And the third signal is the ready signal, a signal which makes the processor slows down whenever it is interfaced with a slow memory or a slow device. So it provides clock, reset, and ready signals. Okay, let's now discuss the function of each pin of the 18 pins of this chip, 8284 chip. This pin, VCC pin, it's an input pin that takes the power supply again 5 volts plus minus 10 percent and the ground to connect the ground to the chip then there is a pin fc slash c bar this pin is used to determine whether the clock frequency is to be generated internally from the chip or provided externally from some other source so if this pin is low is low it means there is a crystal oscillator inside your chip which will generate your clock frequency if the frequency is provided from the outside source and this is allowed in your system we can provide a clock frequency generated from an outside source you have to make this high so high for frequency is provided from an outside source low meaning the frequency the clock frequency is generated by the crystal oscillator inside your chip and when the frequency is provided from the outside source you make this pin high indicating F is high meaning we are bringing in a frequency from outside source and this frequency is connected to a pin in the chip called EFI external frequency input but if F slash C bar is made low we connect through these two pins X1 and X2 a crystal and the frequency the clock frequency will be generated internally using this crystal and if it's provided from an outside source it should be connected the outside source should be connected to this EFI external frequency input then your processor will take the clock frequency from this pin called the clock CLK and it is one third of your crystal oscillator frequency so usually the crystal oscillator reduces the frequency of 15 megahertz while the clock pin provides one third of this value 15 over 3 5 megahertz to operate your 8086 or 8088 processor then a pin called p clock this provides a clock for the peripheral so this is the peripheral clock which is one half the frequency required by your processor so if the oscillator produces 15 megahertz your 8086 8088 requires only one third it takes five megahertz while your peripheral clock is half this value which is 2.5 megahertz it provides the clock for your peripherals speakers and whatever whatever peripheral peripheral connected to your system oscillator this is a pin which provides the clock frequency uh, 
at the, high, the highest frequency 50 megahertz and if your system uses more than a clock generator 82 84 more than one and one of which required to be driven externally the oscillator output of the clock provides the external frequency to any other clock generator at 15 megahertz again if you're using more than a clock generator on your system you need to synchronize your clock so this this pen c sync uses to synchronize the operation of your system when using more than a clock generator and this provides you this rest bar provides your microprocessor a signal long enough to make reset to make your processor reset it has to be made low at least four clock cycle for your processor to place the beginning address of your reset program and the output to your processor is taken from this pin when reset so this reset of your clock is connected to the reset of your microprocessor which will provide a signal whenever you need to reset your system and this reset can be done by your system when you power it up and it is called the power up reset when you first connect your system to the power line 5 volts or can be done manually at user's convenience if you are using a system which is composed of more than a microprocessor you have to synchronize the operation of these processors and provide ready signals for each of these processors if needed for example this address enabled one with the ready one provides the ready signal for your processor number one address enabled two with the ready two provides your ready signal for your processor number two which makes the processor communicate correctly with the hooked devices to the processor so these ready signals ready one and ready two cause your processor to wait if it is connected to a slower device or go ahead and continue executing the instructions at the very same rate of the processor if the devices connected to your processor are compatible with the processor's speed again async synchronizes the ready signals required by each processor in your system in case of using only a single processor 8086 8088 you will make your address enable one high address enable two high ready one low ready two low and communicate only with a single processor this ready output of your processor uh, of your clock sorry is connected to the ready input of your processor again to make it wait if it has to be weighted and here is your internal circuitry of the clock generator you can look at this internal circuitry like this the upper portion is used to generate the clock and do reset the, so this is your reset pin and this is the reset which goes to your processor and the oscillator frequency at the very same value of your crystal 15 megahertz this is your pc clock the clock for your peripherals this is the clock for your processor 
So this portion is to generate three clock frequency. Oscillator frequency of 50 megahertz clock one third this value frequency of 5 megahertz p clock clock frequency for peripherals which is 2.5 megahertz and this is the reset to boot up your system and the lower portion is used to manage the operation of the system if multi processors are used in addition to the ready signal for your processor so it generates your ready signals for your processors okay this goes to either the main processor or processor one or two depending on the values of these address enable one two and ready one and two and this is syn synchronizes the operation of your system and the clock is connected to your processor by the clock output to provide the 5 megahertz required for your 8086-8088 reset to boot up the system or to reset the system whenever it is needed here is the circuit to reset your system if you first place your power supply you power up the system the capacitor initially is fully discharged and a low signal of at least four clock cycle is provided here which makes this reset high which goes to your processor and make your processor starts correctly if for some reason you need to reset your system manually you press this push button your capacitor will get discharged through the ground again a low signal is produced at rest bar which goes high to internally inside your clock to the reset which goes to your practical processor and make it reset bus buffering and latching we need to buffer our data from the bus because as we said previously the bus pins are multiplexed with the address uh, with the data pins so since the same pin can carry a data or a bus you have to buffer this and this again to reduce the number of pins required by any chip or a microprocessor this is why we need to buffer the bus okay because usually the bus is multiplexed can carry address data or pure data and we do this multiplexing that requires demultiplexing to reduce the number of pens required by the system and as previously described there are three buses inside your microprocessor the address bus the data bus and the, can, the control bus and at many incidents they are multiplexed so we need to buffer if the address bus carries an address we need to buffer this address somewhere let it stay for a while till the complete cycle is performed for example here we're showing the buffering of the 8088 processor regarding address and data for example here these pins are multiplexed so they have to be buffered do they carry a's or s's we have to buffer the data here here 
these pins AD0 through AD7 they can carry either addresses or data so they can go to the address bus or the data bus this is why we have to power this data whenever AL is high it means the stored data inside this buffer represent the address and they should go to the address bus otherwise they should go to the data bus here again buffering the 8086 we need two 8-bit buffer for these pins AD0 through AD15 if the pins represent address they go upward to the address bus otherwise they go downward to the data bus in both cases they have to be buffered and this will be cleared by the next slide which shows a fully buffered 8088 fully buffered 8088 now the multiplexed address and data pins 80 through 87 if they represent if they represent address they are buffered through this 373 when it is activated by AL high signal so they go this way if they are representing addresses otherwise if AL ALE is zero they go this way and they get buffered in a different buffer 245 which is bi-directional because data can be going outside your processor okay sent out through your processor or brought into your processor so this buffer is different it's a bi-directional buffer and these are not multiplexed of your 8088 processor so they need to get buffer, buffered in a different buffer 244 because they are not multiplexed likewise the control bus is buffered in an integrated circuit chip 244 because they are not multiplexed these multiplexed pins are buffered in a different chip which is 373 and this is the fully buffered 8086 okay if the data inside ad0 to ad15 represents an address the least significant 16 bits are buffered through 373 goes to the address bus the most significant 16 bits are buffered through 373 goes to the address bus along with the rest the other four address pins if the data inside ed0 the bits inside ed0 through ad15 represent data the lower byte of the data is buffered to through two four five pins and goes to the lower data of your byte and we do the same with the higher byte buffer it in 245 chip and goes to the higher byte of your data bus why do we need to buffer data again because pins first are multiplexed then the data has to be stayed for a while till it is completely sent out read sent out meaning you write your data in your memory or brought in read from a memory to your microprocessor so they have to stay for a while till this cycle is complete and here is a diagram that shows your bus time it's a different from the clock time as seen here each each bus cycle requires one two three four clock cycle which means what which means if your 
processor is operating at a clock frequency of 5 megahertz okay your instructions will be executed at one fourth of this rate 1.25 megahertz okay all right which means 1 million and instruction 250,000 per second for each and each cycle will require 800 microseconds what your system does at this at here they use with the falling edge of the clock the trailing edge of the clock okay good at the first clock cycle t1 the address is placed in the address bus okay here this is multiplexed address and data at the second clock cycle you are reading or writing so now we are writing so we have to activate the processor to write by placing a low signal at this pin okay at the third beginning of the third clock cycle the data is being written all right at the fourth we start deactivating your pins again so it requires four clock cycles to read or write data from and to your microprocessor okay good so this is a simplified 8086 write bus cycle let's define now what your processor does in each clock cycle this is again similar similar cycle but for the read cycle when your processor is reading again at the first clock cycle your address is placed okay and at the second clock cycle your data is being is prepared to be read so we place a low signal at this to read at the third clock cycle we start reading at the fourth clock cycle we finish reading and deactivating your bus pens okay again if your uh, system is operating at some frequency the bus cycle requires four clocking cycles so if you're using a clock of five megahertz one bus cycle would require 800 nanoseconds sorry it's 800 nanoseconds not microseconds all right which means your system is reading and writing data at a rate of one fourth this five mega which is 1.25 megahertz during the first clocking period t1 the address is placed on your address or data bus control signals are also placed to determine whether you're reading or writing from memory or io and whether the data on the bus is an address or not okay during the second period t2 the read or write signals are placed on your control bus and as well the data enable pin is activated during the third 
look false. This allows memory to be accessed. This is the read, the actual read or write operation. You're reading from a memory or writing into the memory. And as well, by the end, the beginning of T3 or the end of T2, the ready signal is sampled. If it is low, means your processor is not ready to complete the cycle because it is coming communicating with a lower device t3 instead of being a cycle to read and write data becomes a waiting state your processor will wait till the memory device is responding because it's a lower device otherwise otherwise if your ready is high the data bus is sampled at the end of t3 Okay, during your fourth clock period T4, all bus signals are deactivated in preparing your bus to the next cycle. Okay. Okay, let's now take a look at the read time bus cycle in a little more detail. Here we have the four clock cycling system clock cycles which constitute the bus cycle okay at t1 at t1 during t1 the processor loads the address to the address bus so now your ad0 to ad15 carries an address this is why your ale is high address latch enable when el is high this indicates the data inside your address bus or inside the multiplexed bus i should say represent an address and depending on m and i o bar this address is referring to a memory or an i o device during the second cycle clock cycle the address is removed while the data is to be placed in the multiplexed bus we are reading so during this whole cycle the dt slash r bar is low indicating that the processor is receiving data from a memory or an io device well once we start replacing the data in the bus your rd signal should be low meaning the processor is reading and whenever the data is set up on the bus your data enable should as well be low indicating that the data is ready now to be read during d t3 we read the data and ready is sampled at the end of t2 if it is high your processor does not add any waiting cycle if it is low it, it indicates that the processor is not ready and a wait cycle may be inserted instead of T3 okay when a memory is interfaced with the microprocessor there should be some compatibility speed compatibility between the processor and the memory so there is some parameter called an access time which is the time the memory can read can place a data to be read or take a data when the processor writes a data to this memory as a matter of fact three cycles are consumed in reading a data or in accessing a data the processor allows 600 nanoseconds for these three cycles okay The processor needs 110 nanoseconds for placing a data and the setup time for the data to be placed on the bus. And 
30 nanosecond as a guard band so out of these 600 nanoseconds the processor will consume 140 nanoseconds for set up a data then the left is 460 nanoseconds which should be the memory access time so the memory should access data in no more than 460 nanoseconds this is why if the memory is slow a ready signal is sent to the processor if it's a high it tells the processor the time allowed for the memory is not enough to be accessed this is why we have to add a wait state so we slow down the processor letting the memory be accessed okay so if 460 nanoseconds is not enough for a memory to be accessed we add additional cycle of 200 nanosecond making all available time for the memory to be accessed 660 nanoseconds this is by sending a high signal to the ready input of the processor so the clock generator in this case sends a high signal to the ready input of your processor indicating a need for a wait cycle to be placed after t2 on the other hand if the ready is zero t3 comes right after t2 so no tw and again in the middle of tw the ready signal is checked if your memory is slower than this and requires more than a wait cycle in the middle of the tw your ready signal is checked if it is still low we place another wait state okay like here this is now at the end of t2 we sample the ready okay during 8 nanosecond if your ready signal goes from high to low indicating it's going to a low signal a tw is placed <coughs> and again in the middle of your tw your ready signal is sampled if it is going from low to high so your ready signal is going to be high no need to add an additional weight state and the rdy is a signal generated internal in your clock 8284 which makes your ready internally in the clock be high sent to the microprocessor so what signal used to synchronize the radio of your processor is the RDY. This is the signal used to synchronize your processor with the clock. And the timing diagram is as such. This is your clock again. At the end, if your T2, okay, your ready is signal your RDY is made low which sends which sends a low ready signal to your processor a low ready signal to your processor indicating a need of a need of TW and here is your ready ready when it makes this ready low your processor insert a wait state 
or your clock adds a weight state after t2 if it is high it means your processor does not need to slow down its speed it can access the memory right away okay here we're going to explain the circuit which helps generate the ready state the ready signal for the microprocessor to insert a weight state inside the bus cycle to make the processor wait till the memory is ready to be accessed okay and the beauty of this circuit is that it can provide zero weight state no weight state up to seven weight states so you can use the circuit to introduce no weight state a single weight state two weight states four weight states till seven weight states and here the circuit this is a shift register which shifts the zero through the output queues qa qb qc at the beginning of the bus cycle all these signals are high read bar write bar interrupt acknowledge bar clearing this shift register okay if a memory device is interfaced with the microprocessor a signal coming from the memory device to this circuit we call it chip select okay and this is a zero so if a memory device sends a zero to the circuit okay then the circuit waits for a zero or a one through these outputs so if qb is connected if qb is connected then a zero is inserted once in the circuit so this is a zero or do this zero bringing in a zero inside your clock generator making rdy zero sent out from the generator through the ready pin to the ready pin of the microprocessor which makes it again zero so the microprocessor receives a zero signal at its ready input which means your microprocessor is not ready to access the memory and a wait state should be inserted inside the bus cycle uh, after the end of t2 so during t1 during t1 these are high then at the end of t2 a signal is coming from the memory device which is zero and another zero is coming from this shift register making a generation of a weight state okay and here is the timing diagram which further explains what was going on on the previous circuit okay at the rising edge of the clock t2 okay qb is a zero with the zero coming from the memory chip these two zeros produce a low ready signal which indicates to the clock circuitry to introduce a wait state after t2 inserted between t2 and t3 during the read cycle if a state <coughs> qc was connected and instead of qb it is zero at the riding edge of t2 and at the middle of tw it is also a zero meaning if qc was connected 
we add here a T weight, a clock cycle, and we add another clock cycle here. So if no clock cycle is needed, you get the output at you connect a QA of your shift register. If a single clock cycle you connect QB, if three clock cycles are uh, two clock cycles are required, you connect your QC. Okay. So the last topic to be discussed in this chapter is the minimum and maximum modes of operation of your microprocessor. Okay, so your microprocessor can be used to operate in its minimum mode or in its maximum mode. So what are the differences between the minimum mode and the maximum mode? Here you are. In the minimum mode, your microprocessor does not accept any external signal, any external control signal, and it is the least expensive mode to use the microprocessor in. The minimum possible circuitry and the minimum possible control signals. So no control signals are allowed to be accepted from outside your microprocessor. All control signals are internally generated. Okay. Your peripherals communicate easily with your microprocessor through AT85A chip. Okay, while in the maximum mode, you can connect your main processor to other processors, especially a coprocessor known as a math coprocessor. When you solve rigorous math problems, you would need an ancillary processor to be used with your main processor. We call this a math coprocessor, a processor used beside the main processor to help in solving rigorous math problems. Okay, but this way of using math coprocessor with the main processor was dropped from processor 8286 and up. Okay, so the build whatever needed to solve rigorous math and whatever circuitry required for this is built in in 8286 and above. Control signals in this mode are accepted from external devices or external buses. So there is control signals coming to your microprocessor through external wires. So there is a bus controller, a bus outside your microprocessor chip, a bus that sends in and out control signals as well as data. Okay, and again, this is required whenever a coprocessor is to be used with your main processor. Okay, this is the end of lecture 10. We'll meet you, inshallah, and lecture 11. Thank you.